Welcome everybody to this very rich and interesting session about wild tastes of Asia. First for food and first for our future. It's going to be a very wild session with um, our friends from the Non-Timber Forest Products Exchange Program in Asia, which is a member of the Green Livelihoods Alliance and coordinating the Wild Food and Biodiversity and Livelihood Network. They will share their views and experience from South and Southeast Asia about the importance of forest foods for forest dependent indigenous people and local communities and the vital linkage between wild food, biodiversity and community based livelihoods. We will hear about their outlook on um, the future of forest of biodiversity and how forest systems are integrated, how they protected and enhanced. Most of us are joining us through Asia, but we have a distinguished guest that I would like to invite on the stage, so to say, uh, which is Sumin George uh, from Keystone, India. Welcome, Sumin. Uh, great that you can be here. If you, for the moment, uh, you can sit here. Hello, uh, maybe you can, uh, as you are the live guest here, uh, shortly introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. My name is Suman, uh, Suman George, and I work with Keystone Foundation and we are an NGO based in the southern part of India, but we do work uh, in other parts of India through the NTFPP India Network. So we hope to share our experiences in working on this particular topic later on. Thank you very much. And happy to be here also. Great, Sumin. So um, before we begin, uh, let's watch a short video explainer from uh, the Non-Timber Forest uh, Exchange Program. Um, yes, uh, let's show that and show what uh, are wild foods. Forests nurture over 1 billion people. Forest resources and ecosystem services strongly intertwine with human history, culture, and collective identity. Indigenous peoples call forests their home, garden, and hospital all in one. In the face of a food, biodiversity, and health crisis, it is high time to cherish our forests. Wild foods offer a way forward. Wild foods are edible non-timber forest products which include plants, plant parts, fungi and animals that form part of a rich diversity that people harvest in the forests, woodland edges, traditional gardens and farms. These include leaves, seeds and nuts, shoots and stems, root crops, fruits, flowers, fish, meat, and insects. Being part of traditions refined through millennia, these foods open a window into the wealth of knowledge and skills that we need to achieve sustainability. In many ways, wild foods complete the puzzle when it comes to nutrition, health, and sustainable resource management. Creating conscious markets for wild foods can help distribute the benefits of this knowledge and experience in our societies and reduce poverty among local and traditional communities. However, it can only work if the value chains and trade of wild foods hold to high sustainability standards and respect for the traditions, identity, and values that they represent. Otherwise, we risk further exploitation and destruction of forests by unsustainable harvest, logging, plantations, infrastructure, mining, and other extractive industries. Deforestation and forest degradation undermine food security and biodiversity, destroying the spaces that shelter and nourish many people who depend on forests to live. Vice versa, nurturing nature by focusing on wild foods can revive forests, reduce hunger, and bring prosperity to forest-dependent communities. What is more, wild foods may answer some of the critical questions of identity and ecology that we encounter today. With dedicated attention and through research, dialogue, conservation, restoration, social marketing, social enterprises, wild foods can continue to thrive and feed our bodies, minds, and souls.
That's a great uh, intro movie about wild foods. Um, and as I'm not an expert, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to this session to learn a lot about this uh, session. I, I would like to uh, therefore invite uh, Femi Pinto, the executive director at the Non-Timber Forest Products Exchange Program Asia, or in short, NTFPEP. Uh, Femi Pinto, uh, welcome to uh, Marseille. Welcome to the public here. Uh, yeah, too bad that you cannot be here, but great that we, in this uh, technological age, uh, we can uh, be here together still. Um, yes, uh, I, I would like to give you the word, um, Femi. Thank you. Thank you, Sander. And good morning to everyone in Marseille and good afternoon, good evening to all tuning in from elsewhere. Um, we're still pleased that we could join you today, even if just virtually. Uh, I myself am joining from the Philippines. And uh, as Sander had already introduced, uh, I'm from the Non-Timber Forest Products Exchange Program Asia or NTFP EP. It is a membership association of individuals. Femi, could you speak slightly louder? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So it is, uh, as I was saying, um, NTFP Exchange Program is a membership association of individuals and community-based civil society organizations and NTFP country programs from across countries in South and Southeast Asia. And we are also joined by like-minded individuals outside the Asia region. NTFP's commitment is to enable local communities to elevate community-based conservation, indigenous culture, knowledge systems and practices, gender and community rights through enhancing capacity and spaces such as this for IPLC voices and actions towards a more resilient, sustainable and secure collective future. Some of us from the network are here representing also their own organizations, their communities and other networks that they are a part of. They are here to feature such perspectives about the importance of forests and biodiversity for food for cultures and for livelihoods. Indigenous knowledge and practices about forests and of wild foods are kept intact and are thriving in our region, but in some parts are, are under threat, driven by an extractivist economic model. Access to wild foods are sometimes also in, impeded and fenced off by protected areas, or in other instances, customary forests and lands are taken over or handed over to companies for other purposes other than the continued practice of traditional landscape or ecosystem protection and management by indigenous peoples and local communities, blocking off access to forest foods and traditional livelihood. Knowledge about wild foods are also declining with many of the youth and the employable migrating to urban centers. In the past year, NTFP in collaboration with experts in their own fields including indigenous people, local community organizations and youth representatives, civil society organizations. These are experts around the knowledge and practice of wild foods harvest and collection. And in, it, and in its related fields, such as natural resources management, biodiversity conservation, rural livelihoods and the promotion and the security of tenure and community rights. We have embarked on a series of learning sessions in the past year and also dialogues and now have come as the Wild Foods Biodiversity and Livelihood Network, together to cultivate greater support for the protection, recognition, and enhancement of indigenous and traditional livelihood systems of which wild foods are a critical part. From India, Indonesia, and the Philippines, we would like to share examples of community-based and network initiatives to promote and sustain wild foods or forest foods and how these benefit local diets well-being and contribute to a maintenance of a dynamic and culture-bound ecosystem. Forest foods and, un and uncultivated traditional foods or crops amidst this pandemic, the twin biodiversity and climate crisis are under threat. We will invite everyone to join our call to action to strengthen, protect and conserve forests for food and people and for our collective future. Lastly, in October 19, just before the pandemic viciously hit, we launched this book, Wild Tastes in Asia, Coming Home to the Forest for Food. And uh, before, when we were planning to uh, do this all uh, on site, uh, we were planning to also bring you uh, these books, but uh, the, this is available online 
So um, you will see also later our principal author of the book, uh, Madhu Ramnath. He will share his latest work after this book was put together. And um, before I turn over to Sumin, who will uh, begin the sharing, I would like to just read a few lines and uh, from the book, from the intro of the book. And it goes, um, forest as home, home as forest. The forest is home to indigenous peoples. It is in this home space that most indigenous peoples cultivate their land or hill slopes, where they fish in the streams and rivers, where they trap or hunt game, where they sing and dance and pass on what they know to the young people and of their race. But since prehistoric times, and especially during and after colonial times, forests have been changing. They have been mined for their timber and other produce. They have served as hunting reserves for princes and noblemen. And more recently, they have had the rivers flowing through them, dammed or diverted to fulfill requirements that would define modernity and progress. Gas pipelines cross indigenous territories. These processes have pushed many indigenous peoples further into the hinterlands or to higher and less accessible slopes. It is these hinterlands that is home to the people whose foodways we now explore and learn about and where such wisdom survives. Thank you. And I turn back to you, Sander and Sumit. Thank you, uh, Femi. So, so is this a book? Uh, uh, yes, it is. Yeah. And where is it available? Um, right now it can be, it can be um, we haven't actually uh, put it up um, like for for mass consumption online, but you can go to ntfp.org um, and uh, inquire for, on how to download, how we will be able to uh, access it. And we okay. can send also a PDF. Okay, great. Maybe we can include it in the YouTube chat as well uh, later on. Okay, then. Exactly, yeah. Thank you very much for this introduction, uh, Femi Pinto, director of NTFPP Asia. Uh, now I would like to introduce Sumin George, who is a project coordinator at Keystone Foundation. He coordinates the conservation program at Keystone, working on human wildlife conflicts, conservation outreach, and coordinating the overall activities of the conservation group. Sumin, welcome uh, to the stage, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, hi. So uh, here I'm going to talk about our collective uh, experiences and learnings of dealing with wild foods in India. Yeah. Okay. So today we'll be mainly discussing the issues around the work in the Indian subcontinent. And as I mentioned earlier, I represent Keystone Foundation and also the NTFPP India Network. Uh, just some pictures. Yeah. So, I mean, as, as is the case, yeah. Uh, wild foods are an integral part of indigenous communities across the world. And it's no different from how it is in, in India because it kind of holds a lot of knowledge and the wealth of knowledge is really deep. And it's mainly on how to harvest it, where to find it, and also where it is found and lots of things associated with it. And the best part being is the knowledge is basically transferred by seeing and learning. And there are many things for us to learn from this as well. There's some pictures from the field. Yeah, so as mentioned, Femi had mentioned, this book came up a couple of years ago, and it really celebrates the, uh, I mean, the topic of wild foods and its association with indigenous communities in South and Southeast Asia. And uh, it also says about how the space is hospitable for those who collect. And uh, it also brings in some levels of confidence for people that they can gather their food while they're outdoor. And it's also like, you know, brings together that intimacy that one has with nature. So some pictures again. And uh, like when, you, when one talks about wild food, like there would be a mainstream or traditional uh, meanings to it. But when you look at it in a, in a practical sense, what does a wild food mean? It is basically I'm taking something which I haven't cultivated or grown or neither is it domesticated 
And do you call it wild or semi-wild or semi-domesticated? We don't know because it's quite hard to uh, categorize it. And uh, so some of our interventions in this field has also been to kind of, you know, come up with protocols for harvest if they don't exist and also see that if some of these species can be cultivated. Sorry about me moving away from the mic. Yeah, yeah. next week. Uh, so when you talk about wild foods, like what is wild? So uh, in, in our country, like wild means it's totally in violet spaces. And uh, like when Madhu had made this example, so when someone told like we are, people are consuming wild tubers, people, the forest department or the officials came running saying that what are they eating when or eating something that they shouldn't be eating. So also like, you know, it's kind of, you know, has that kind of negative connotation in most cases when you say wild food. And uh, also in some cases of like, it's like very macho, like I'm a wild food eater all that and and wild can also mean any space which is non-urban so anything which is non-urban is wild so so also wild food is something that doesn't come to you in pre-packaged form you have to go out and collect it and also to go and collect you need to know a lot of things where to go when to go i mean like many other things to find the right place and the right time and also I mean, there's a lot to know about where to collect a particular food from, and it's not very easy to do that. And also, if there is any chance that it can be cultivated. So in the case of like non-timber forest produce, which is largely collected, like these questions exist there also. Uh, so off late, I mean, there's a lot of publication listing out the different kind of wild foods present, like there are a lot of inventories being generated with interaction with the communities. And there's a lot of scientific and scholarly articles that talk about the nutritive values and the diversity of wild foods. But in our experiences from the villages that we work in and with an interaction with the communities, like it may not be the case as it's said, because it's easier to list these species, but how many of them are consumed and how many of them are still known to the people is still a question because there are a lot of unanswered questions that go with it because time is an important factor because uh, wild food needs extremely large amount of time to go and collect it. And also it is a very involved process. I mean, whether be it an animal or a plant or a fungus, which anything they need to collect, it has its appropriate techniques and time and the methods that need to be employed before it can be collected. And also, knowledge about whether these resources are still available because something which is available before one never knows if it's still available and also each wild food requires a particular skill for its type harvest and you have the skill you have the resource and the, also there's the question of where do you store it should it be under the ground over the ground how it is to be stored so all these associated things always have to be factored in when you talk about wild food and it doesn't really limit to listing the diversity of wild foods alone. So that's what we came to know through our work on wild foods in the country. So in the pictures. Yeah. Uh, so where do we collect wild food from? So actually it's available in all landscapes and mostly in non-urban landscapes, it's abundantly available. So in forests, edges of cultivated fields and some even in rice fields that are intensive, intensively cultivated, you tend to find wild food. And also it could be like yams, tubers, plants, mushrooms, anything that can be collected. Next. Uh, so given all this, I mean, uh, it looks very nice to know that, I mean, wild food is still available in the, in the forests and non-urban spaces, but again, we need to really consider the issue of its availability and consumption. Like one major issue that we, or the communities that we work with face is in terms of the tenure and, and in terms of their access to these wild foods, what was available before, the spaces that they could go to before is no longer available due to various reasons. And also in not every case is the knowledge being transferred because as I, as I said before, most of this is seen and learned. So nothing is really written down in any form. 
So how much of traditional knowledge has been transferred across generations is also something in question. And also the market interventions with different kinds of things kind of, you know, shifts the focus away from the traditional and wild foods. And of course, the global phenomenon of deforestation is a contributing factor to this also. And I mean, with intensive agriculture, the chemicals that are put in, it definitely, you know, kills the essential, I mean, essential foods items also. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this tenure really matters because, and these are some of the strategies that, I mean, we, I mean, kind of consider using and of which the main thing being in the Indian context is the Forest Rights Act, where it gives access to the communities at the individual level, at the village level, and also at the larger community level. But again, like how people get these rights is still in question because it's not too easy to get your own, the rights to your own land. Uh, so this is something that we are really working on and making sure that it's available to the people as soon as possible because it was an act which came about a decade ago and still nothing much has progressed. And also the ongoing uh, goal of increasing the level of protected areas in the country is also you know, preventing people from accessing their traditional resources. Because the more areas you want to protect, the more the areas become inviolate to the people who have been living there. So this is something also that we need to consider as to how these spaces can be protected, protected and also have, can be given access to the people who have been there from before. Next. And also when it comes to traditional knowledge, like, you know, the big question remains is how relevant it is now, because given the modern age, do we rely on traditional knowledge? How important is it to me? Do I need to know it? So this is also something that we're trying to address. And people due to lack of work in their own villages and surroundings do migrate and learn new things and get used to many things, which kind of you know, moves them away from this kind of uh, wild foods in that sense. And there's a need to reconfirm and reestablish those values among communities or the young, younger generation, which we try to do through many, many trainings and workshops with these communities. And also, the market can be a driving factor, but again, it comes with both its pros and cons because something, if it's newly discovered and if it becomes popular, then of course there's this threat of it being overexploited. Uh, so again, a double-edged concept it is. And one way to address it is harvest protocols. And our, also our question is, can markets help in following this? Because it's easy to create protocols, but to what extent it is followed is something that we need to look into. And markets do, play a very good role in this, but we'll have to see how it is done for the good and not becomes over-exploitative. Uh, then again, the generic problems, which is, a, I think, in, in most parts of the world, this, 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 this prob these problems exist, like deforestation and mainly due to palm oil expansion, infrastructure projects, mining, chemical inputs. So these problems are everywhere. and are to stay for some more time. So we have to navigate ourselves to, you know, make our work on wild foods and its importance to go forward. So again, some facts and figures about uh, wild foods. I'm not all going to read all of it. So, but would like to bring a notice to the last two points. Like there are about 4,000 wild foods recorded worldwide. But again, 24% are in decreasing status as any other species of conservation interest. And uh, so if you would walk into any village in the country, I mean, people can easily list out up to 400 species, but how much of them still use it? I mean, it might be about 10 or 20. So it was abundant or it is abundant. We don't know, but people don't consume as much as they used to do. So again, how wild foods contribute or is part of biodiversity because there's a lot of focus on traditional agriculture and how diverse it can be. So, uh, because like what traditional knowledge, you're also trying to bring up food security to the topic and of which wild foods can be an integral part. And as everyone knows, like monoculture is very popular because it is easier to handle in most cases and gives you good yields but not really good for wild foods because nothing thrives around monoculture uh, crops or plantations. Uh, 
So and again, like shrinking of biodiversity and the parallel language, one is known and one is less known. So we don't know how much it is. And again, how it contributes to wild livelihoods, wild wild foods, like in most cases, like products like honey and fish and bamboo shoots are people I mean, are, are being traditionally sold. But again, as I mentioned before, the more species you add to the list, the more it can be taken out. So that comes with a potential risk, but it can be managed if it is done well. Again, coming to the topic of house protocols is very important when you try to, you know, bring in more things can be so harvested and or collected from the forest and sold. Next. Uh, so again, I'm just leaving you maybe about three points to think about. And maybe if we have time, we can talk about it later. And our inter I mean, speaking about our interventions, as I mentioned earlier, facilitating land rights and access is something very, very important. And through our work across the country, through our direct presence and through our networks, this is something that we really, really focus on because unless the access is there, there's no question of wild foods. So how much can you grow in your backyard? And also it's like very limiting that way because you don't have much of land and everything is out there in the forest. And also, uh, it's also important to document and also have some level of act action research, you know, because creating such materials always triggers memories and like urges people to, you know, put things into practice, if not quickly, but at least at a pace that can be sustained. And we also promote a lot of uh, usage of fallow lands, which are lands that are left, left, I mean, left uncultivated to grow wild foods. And again, we kind of focus again on harvest protocols and how that can be updated or like, you know, uh, put out in a way that people understand and it's more current. And because some protocols may have to change over time, not necessarily, but it's also important that one is up to date as to how things are collected from the forest. And also, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, one. And the last two things being uh, uh, this transfer of traditional knowledge is really very important because uh, it is important that you document things on one side, but again, this oral interaction with the elders and the younger adolescents in the village is very important. And we try to I mean, promote such interactions with the communities and have these tools around that can be used. And also we work a lot with on nurseries to kind of uh, to grow these wild foods and also uh, the, it is important that there is, I mean, if there is wild food, there's, you need some tools to collect it. So that particular tool may not be available. So it's all like bamboo, etc. So even that we try to grow in our nurseries and also our network partners do that. So this is my last slide. So sorry, I took a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> that was not the intention. <laughs> just to make, I just throw some more questions. Thanks. Sumin, thank you. Uh, that was indeed a very interesting uh, presentation, very rich. I, I have a question for you. What is your favorite wild food? Honey, of course. Honey. <laughs> it's the, the sweetest wild food. Okay, that's, that's interesting to hear. Now, uh, I would like to go to a, a very small movie uh, where um, uh, we, we see uh, the... Adukam Research Center and Forest Food Field School up in the Palni Hills in uh, India. So uh, yeah, uh, please uh, see how it goes here with regard to wild foods. Uh, we are in Adukam, which is a small village in the Palni Hills of the Western Ghats of India. And here we've set up a resource center focusing on wild foods and other plants. The idea behind the resource center is to revive and re rejuvenate the knowledge about forest foods. Much of this knowledge we have today comes from tribal people. And unfortunately, the tribal people themselves are losing the, their knowledge and also the importance of tribal, uh, of wild foods in their lives. plan 
plant belongs to the ginger family, known as Costa speciosus. It's easily, easily identifiable by the spiral arrangement of leaves and its rhizome is usually made into chutneys, preferably with red ants and known to clear hangovers, any kind of dizziness and is a very good appetizer. This is Olax scandens, the botanical name of something called Badri in much of central India. There are different local names and the tender leaves are eaten and they are very known for their high nutritive values today due to research. Olax scandens is a climber and as you see I have left in this garden most of the climbers and mainly because climbers are the arboreal highways for mammals and they are very useful for seed dispersal done by arboreal mammals. This yam is called Dioscoria bulbifera, commonly also known as the air potato. And it's one of the widely cultivated yams along with Dioscoria alata in India and also in Southeast Asia. Uh, it's the above ground part, this bulbil, which is eaten. And in this place, it's intercropped with the banana. When we consider the world of plant foods, wild plant foods which are edible and eaten, one of the important genera is Dioscoria. This is an example of a Dioscoria. It's Dioscoria demona. And there are about 630 species of Dioscorias in the world, of which 25 are well known in, in South India. Now, Dioscoria demona, for example, needs to be processed before being eaten. Overnight, and they left overnight the tubers in uh, running water and then cooked the following day, the water drained off, after which they may be consumed. This, this is due to the toxic principles which these tubers contain. And this uh, plant is called Transhera redani. And the identifying character for this is the way the leaf actually breaks. When you fold it, it just breaks. And this is a very good identifying character for it. We've devoted certain uh, a space to plant various kinds of tubers and other green uh, leafy vegetables from collected from all over the country, especially South and Central India, so that we can reintroduce such knowledge to the people, the local people and the tribal people, which can help in better health. This is Dioscoria triphyla, called Mulluvalli in Tamil, and a very sought, sought after tuber. It's a left twining Dioscoria. And the way it's been dug is by leaving the main mother tuber intact so that they can come back the next year and start digging. So this is last year's bit. And this is this year's tubers, which we will cook and eat. And it doesn't go too deep. It doesn't need much processing and is it has many, many nutritive qualities. Other things that we do in this resource center is to teach about nurseries, seed collection, germination techniques and water. How to understand water quality by measuring uh, various parameters in water and related aquatic plants. Some of these aquatic plants are also edible, so it continues with the wild food uh, subject. Uh, people are able to come and stay here, there's a place to stay. There is a fairly adequate library around these subjects and they can understand hands-on work around wild foods and related matters of conservation.
for our next speaker, uh, it, the Wild Foods are not only rich, but it's also a very rich program. Uh, we have a next speaker, which is Ibu B. Bong, and she is representing the Parara Indonesian Ethical Store. And uh, Bi Bong, I, I would like to welcome you here to Marseille. Uh, very welcome. Uh, I hope you are, are doing fine. Uh, can you shortly introduce yourself? And uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you very much for yes. the time. Good morning and good afternoon in here in Indonesia, especially. My name is Mibong Midiarti. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting to me to share about something uh, Parara with you today. I'm speaking on behalf of the Parara Indonesian Ethical Store. Uh, do you want to next if you want the next slide please uh, yes yeah, okay say, next slide next slide please yes and and please speak loud into the microphone thank you it says this restaurant and the store is initiated by parara consortium a civil society movement promoting local product that are safe and healthy for consumption, sustainable produce, and fairly traded. Parara is comprised for over 30 NGO, cooperative, women association, social enterprise that support over 100 farmers groups, forest gardener, communities, small producer, and fisher folk. Here you see a photo collage of some of our partner and what they produce. For the next next slide, yeah, okay. Okay, next slide. We came together in 2015 with the concept of a festival in the center of Jakarta to promote local product in a big way. We have seen her festival every two years since then. Next slide. Uh, parara uh, in Indonesian language is Panen Raya Nusantara. It's a fair trade marketing platform and movement that shake to improve the welfare of Indonesian community producer by promoting product based on conservation, culture, and local tradition. Its business unit featuring a food, craft, personal care product that are healthy and safe for consumers. And the long-term goals are in sustainable production and consumption in the country and the reduced depends of imported foods. We have a tagline, keep the tradition to take care of the earth, or in Indonesian language, jaga tradisi rawat bumi. This is, you can see about the parara and uh, how about the promote import uh, for alternative to import, improve uh, import food and then promote sustainable production and consumption. Or next slide. This is our core value, local, healthy, fair and sustainable. We have a Jaga Tradisi and Rawat Bumi as a tagline. This is our core view. Uh, Parara producer community signs of declaration of their product along with local partner or stakeholders. And then Parara prepare supplier contract to the trace the chains from supplier to the store across the parameters. It's the, the core value. Some of them, uh, 
just uh, already to try the PGS. And the next, you can see the logo of the Parara uh, with the others, all uh, partners and our scope. Here's a logo for uh, members of Parara, more than uh, 30 organization supporting more than a hundred local producer and then promoting this uh, core value, local, healthy, healthy and sustainable. We also have ambition to have a Parara store in major city on different major island of Indonesia. So as to highlight local food in the province where they are found and reduce carbon footprint to bring food to Jakarta. Next slide. Here is in Jakarta. Uh, yeah, okay. Parara Ethical Store, uh, we, we call it PS, seek to integrate local food into the diets of Indonesian consumer through healthy twist or familiar Indonesian meals and other nose, Asian and Western dishes. These are examples of sagu noodles replacing with noodles with a sago. For the next slide, you can see the uh, carbonara parara, sago noodles in here, and then a soto bandar. We, we use uh, sago noodles. We replace a uh, standard uh, Italian carbonara with ancorfi with a uh, fish from Central Sulawesi. And then we, Indonesian comfort food, a uh, soto banjar. Uh, it's like a chicken noodle soup variant because in Indonesia, we have so much soto in every area from um, Indonesian archipelago. Next. One of wild food featuring oil is dried bamboo shoot. Dayak bamboo shoot are traditional preserved by Dayak Kanayan of West Kalimantan. They are traditional use in daily meals and for a case special occasion like festival and wedding party. They are our main three species use uh, betu uh, in uh, large in size and the second is munti, bamboo munti, we call it small in the size and the third is the trekken, the same size as uh, munti. This uh, planted a long time ago and grow in forest system. Next photo. In this photo, you can see the process of harvesting and preparing by shoot of the Dayak Kanayan at West Kalimantan. They go into the forest in the group, four and five people. As not everyone knows where sustainable bamboo stood are found. There are safety in number, as often there are snakes around the bamboo clumps. Bamboo shoots are harvested and brought back to the home, clean and dried. It's a processing of bamboo shoot. Next slide. After drying the bamboo shoot, they shrink about until 40 and 50% and where the bamboo shoot are ready to be cooked. Uh, they must uh, first uh, soak when, you, when, you, when they want to use it. And then they can soak it or cook it with, made with milk or coconut milk. In this, uh, for next, uh, Next slide. This is Paraya used bamboo shoot in Japanese snack standard. Uh, we call it a sausage solo rebung. 
because rebung in Indonesian language is is the same uh, bamboo shoots in English. Okay, the next. Uh, we replace uh, sauce with bamboo shoot, uh, just making a dish or variant. Uh, the next, and after the other presentation, dish please. For our cooking is well transparent. We are called a carbon in Kerinci, uh, a special area in West Sumatra. It's grow and stop, and young like eating the snack. Okay, next slide. In 90. And 2019, uh, the NGO Kaka Iwarsi assisted the develop of jam from raspberry and also helped the woman producer from the village Soko Pangkat to form a group. And then next slide, the woman group called a Suko Suko Suka all try to make a raspberry banana chip and then raspberry candy, but the main product is, is a strawberry, a raspberry jam. Next. Okay. Para experience, make uh, some experience with making purple jam floor, cake and wild raspberry buttercream. We will show the video how to make the raspberry buttercream after this PPT. It's come to the end of my presentation. Thank, Thank you, you Bibong. Actually, this is so tasty that I'm uh, I'm getting a bit hungry. <laughs> These okay. are uh, very tasty, uh, uh, yeah, uh, different uh, things. It's really, uh, I would love to taste all of this. And uh, maybe uh, we can go to uh, a, a very small video uh, about uh, the Kerben butter cream. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm very curious about this. Thank you, Bibong. So that uh, this is not only uh, a lesson about plant diversity and biodiversity, but also about cooking. So this is uh, you can watch it back on the YouTube channel. And uh, thank you very much for this uh, this presentation about the Parara Indonesian ethical store. It's, it, I mean, I, I'm very impressed with its uh, its professionality, and it's it's it just makes me so hungry. So let's go to the to the next uh, speaker uh, because we we have a, a whole list of dynamic voices um, from the youth of the Philippines who will share their dreams and present their actions about revitalizing and protecting their biodiversity, keeping the knowledge of their elders, but also about wild foods and biodiversity. Um, so um, I first like to introduce Crystal Quiñeres. I hope I'm saying it right. Yes, she is uh, Crystal. Uh, yes, um, are, are you there with us? Um, um, 
or is it a video? Okay, your your through the video link. Yes, then Crystal, we will uh, are looking forward to hear you from the video. Um, as Crystal is is an oh, there's the video. That's great. <laughs> Magandang araw po. Ako po si Crystal Keres, isang katutubong kabataan ng Tribal Tumagat. Nice ko rin pong ipahagi kung gaano nga ba talaga kalaga o kaimportante ang katutubong pagkain o ang wal na pagkain sa aming pamilya. Mahalaga ang mga ito para sa amin sa pagkain. Hindi lamang ito kasama sa mga ang araw-araw na pagkainan ng Pamilyang katutubo, kundi isa rin ito sa mga bagay na nakakapagpanatili ng tunay at kakaibang ganda ng kalikasan. Kung saan sa kalikasan na rin nakaugnay ang aming kultura. Dahil sa kalikasan na rin sumulat mula ang kaisipan ng aming mga ninuno, kung paano ito natuklasan at kung paano nila ginawa ang mga proseso nito na hanggang ngayon ay amin pa rin ginagawa at alam pa rin ng hanggang ngayon kahit ng mga kamata. Ang mga katutubong pagkain o want na pagkain din ay isa sa mga pangunahing itinuturing aming pagkakakailanlan bilang tribo. Halimbawa, kapag sinabing Pinuto, sasabihin agad na ay galing sa katutubo, sa katutubo at sa tribong dumagat ang salitang iyan o ang pagkain na iyan. Kaya kung mawawala ang mga ito ay maaari ring magkaroon ng posibilidad na malaking bahagi ng aming kultura ang maglahon. At ito po papasok yung mga malaking hadlang kung pinag-uusapan ang mga Katutubo o valid na pagkain sa saring buhay at kabuhayan sa buhay ng mga katutubo dahil na rin sa mga pagpasok ng mga makabagong pangmaraan na na-adapt na rin ng mga katutubo at napapag-iwanan na kung ano ang aming nasa kultura. Nawawala na ang mga pagpapahalaga sa mga ito at kasama na rin sa nawawala unti-unti ang sentro ng kultura na pagbabahagi na, na kung saan ang kahalagahan nito sa amin kahalagahan ng pagbabahagi na, ay para nating pagpapahalaga sa Diyos sa kay makidepend sa mga biyaya na ibinibigay niya sa atin lalo na kapag sa pagbabahagi sa iba pa mga iyong atribo kahit na sa pinakamalayong lugar ay ay nagpapalala na malalim pa kaugnayan mo sa kanya at malalim pa ang pakahulagan mo sa iyong kultura. Kasabay ng pagkakaroon ng mga kasanayan, lalong-lalo na sa mga pag-organisa, sa hanay ng mga kabataan at kababaihan, na magkaroon ng mga hakbang kung paano ito mapapanatili. Dahil sa ngayon nga po ay may kakulangan pa rin lalo na sa mga kasanayan, sa pag-oorganisa, upang lalo itong pagtunan bilang bahagi ng buhay ng mga katutubo. Maraming salamat. So that, that's a voice really from uh, the Philippines, a youth, a 19-year-old youth leader in Kuzon, whose dreams it is to, to, to be a great teacher and to, to maintain her culture uh really uh thank you uh crystal for for this uh, video um yeah it's it's quite interesting how uh this diversity and we we need to fight for that diversity and, and make sure that this culture and these these values are lived on there and uh if we talk about nature-based solutions for example i mean this is a nature-based solution you know this this is the real thing uh, so uh, I, I would like to share another story with you, which is about Colleen Sumonda, which is an active youth of uh, Silo Nantang Itoi uh, community uh, located in Barangay, San Luis. Uh, she's a bookkeeper for uh, a community-based enterprise that produces pure citronella oil. Uh, Colleen uh, has uh, also a small movie that uh, she would like to share with us. 
um, and uh, Colleen um, has joined various online engagement about the slow food movement, including a photo essay contest where she featured a lab crop which have already gained more than a thousand likes and reacts on Facebook. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to the video of Colleen. Uh, and um, is that possible to show? Um, that's coming up the video in one moment. Yes, there it is, great. Mahinungdanon ang tradisyonal nga pagkaon nga gikan sa lasang para kanako nga usa ka higaunon tungod kay kung tigutom o tigkauhol mauman ang among dali nga madaganan ug nakabase diri ang among panginabuhi kultura o pagtuon sa tribo Ang mga tradisyonal nga pagkaon nga among gakakuha sa lasang o gakakaon hangtod karon mao ang labo ubod sa ratan ubod sa pula usa langgam baboy halas ug uban pang mananap ug tanom sa yuta ug katubigan Apan adunay babag nga among nasinati sa paggamit og tradisyonal nga mga pagkaon kontrolado na ang among panguha sa nagkalain-laing mananap o tanom sulod sa among lasang tungod sa balaod sa DNR dugang pa usapod kahagit nga ang mga kabatan unan karon dili na kaila ug kabalo mo sa mga pagkaon ang uban ila kining ikaulaw ang pagkaon ug mga nagutmon ambaw ug uban pa ang akong pangandoy nga ang mga kabatan unan matudluan sa mga tradisyonal nga pamaagi sa pagproseso ni ini nga mga pagkaon aron dili kini mawala ug mapadayon sa sunod nga henerasyon unta adunay panagtigom sa mga katigulangan ug mga kabatan unan aron hisgutan ang among IKSP sa pagkaon nga makita sa lasang inubanan sa suporta sa komunidad LGU NGU ug uban pang mga ahensya So so that was uh, Colleen Sumonda which uh, shows us that uh, for certain communities it is crucial to to keep uh, those traditions uh, and, and connect to that the forests. Uh, very inspiring. It's not, uh, as I interpreted, not that uh, uh, in the cases, for example, with COVID, it is important that you can keep connecting to the forest because when uh, certain uh, other uh, crises are there, you have this access. Uh, especially for those uh, more vulnerable communities. And Colleen, uh, thank you very much for this uh, signal and this video. Then another person from Palawan, which is uh, John Vincent Golili um, and Masha Sar, uh, and they, they are co-founders of the youth group uh, Samahan. Uh, with uh, uh, and it's a united indigenous youth group and they have assisted in the mapping resource inventory and the monitoring of the palawan indigenous community reserve which is actually an ICA um, in southern palawan and produced and filmed the palawan traditional cuisine and food documentary already tasty uh, john collili currently works at the palawan state university philippines um, John, I believe that you are here with us uh, directly, right? Um, I'm looking forward to you. Welcome, John. Thank you for joining Hello. us here in Marseille uh, at the World Conservation Congress. We're very happy to have you here. And uh, yes, could you shortly introduce yourself? And we're looking forward to your presentation. Um, yes, um, hello, everyone. So you have already heard from Christelle and Pulin. So 
Uh, I am Jan from Palawan, the Philippines. I'm an indigenous youth leader, uh, as have introduced. So um, today uh, we will be sharing uh, a short documentary uh, of our food festival, which was uh, held last November 2020. So enjoy. Thank you, John. Uh, we will play the documentary uh, and uh, right now. Oh, we're... that's great. Yes. <laughs> Milton Madiato, Presidente po ng aming samahan. Samahan ng nagkakaisang katutubong kabataan. Sabi nga ng aming mga kagungurangan, mahalaga daw ito isagawa sa tuwing katapusan ng aming ane o kadataon.
mahalaga po. Mahalaga din po sa amin yung gawain pag luluto ng luklot. Dahil ito po ay namana yung mga sinaunang ninuno pa namin. Para rin uh, mapalawak yung kaalaman sa pagluluto ng luklot. Maipanatili ang luklot. Oh. Ipasa namin sa school na generasyon. So yeah, that's that's a lot of different crops uh, in Palawan, uh, and and a huge produced uh, video. Uh, thank you, uh, John, Vincent, and Masia for uh, producing this video, uh, showing uh, how the Palawan youth is adopting some of these uh, interesting uh, practices uh, and and the traditional culture. Um, Thank you very much. Um, maybe Vincent, I also want I want to ask you one more question, uh, if that's okay. Uh, uh, what What is your uh, favorite? Uh, what's your favorite crop? What, what did you learn when you made this video? Uh, like, I mean, I'm very curious what what your uh, you made this video and what new crop or new practice did you uh, learn about? Um, well, for me, um, of course, a lot because uh, even though I'm uh, a member of the tribe, uh, I uh, I was um, I grown uh, somewhat uh, on the um, downlands of our community, so I missed uh, pretty much a large part of our cultures and tradition. So this event was like uh, much more as uh, revisiting um, and also um, and to the first question, um, my favorite um, crop. Uh, that is being produced by our tribe would be um, the, the sticky rice, the indigenous sticky rice, because um, it's probably one of the most uh, versatile kind of crop we have because um, uh, I just want to share because most of those um, delicacies that we have shared, like the lot lot, mol mol, and apit apit uh, that was shown on the video um, were actually based on the sticky rice. So, okay. yeah. The sticky rice basically connects all those wild foods in a way. Uh, and uh, okay, that's that's interesting. Uh, okay, then uh, thank you very much, uh, John Vincent and Masia, for making this video. Now we, we have a short uh, moment uh, to to reflect uh, a couple other perspective. Uh, actually, I would like to uh, invite uh, somebody from the public that we have here a guest, uh, which is also part of the Green Livelihoods Alliance. Uh, Diana, uh, I'm, I'm very curious about your reflections about uh, wild foods. And uh, if you have any questions to uh, all the, the people in, or to, uh, to sue me. Uh, so uh, could you please come forward, Diana? And, uh, I'm curious to hear your reflections from the African perspective uh, and, and any questions that you have to them. Welcome and introduce yourself. Oh. Okay. Um, thank you, Sanda. And uh, thanks to all the people who've uh, shared today. Uh, it's been uh, interesting to watch uh, the foods look uh, that have been shared look very nutritious. I have some reflections based on what I've seen. Um, you know, I usually say that uh, humanity is one, while well, we are separated by vast waters and, and, and oceans and seas, uh, you know, largely we are one because uh, some of the foods that I saw from uh, our colleagues are similar to some of the foods that we have in Uganda. For instance, uh, we also have bamboo, bamboo shoots. They are eaten by a community from a uh, Eastern Uganda. And then we also do have wild yams, but they seem to have more di diversity. And perhaps uh, that could be because, uh, unfortunately for us, we've kept uh, losing our forests. And uh, with the loss of our forests has come with the loss of uh, our wild foods that you know our ancestors 
you know it. And then uh, they also, there's been introductions of various uh, new foods due to interactions with other groups of people. That's uh, a great thing. But you find that, uh, you know, the food that we had originally and that was very nutritious, we have lost. For instance, I don't even know the name, but last year I found out that Uganda has that very colorful maize, purple, uh, a bit of yellow and other colors that we see with um, I first saw it with the uh, indigenous tribes in, uh, in, in, in America, in the US, and we used to have those in Uganda. That was our original maize, but then the white maize was introduced. So for me, the key takeaway from this is that um, in order to protect our wild foods that still exist, so we still have some mushrooms and uh, honey and uh, the bamboo shoots, but in order to protect those, we need to protect our forests. And that's why the GLA, uh, program or project is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. So yeah, indeed, uh, uh, Uganda uh, inspired uh, all uh, these talks. And what indeed is important to, of course, a lot is lost, but uh, still a lot remains. And, and what uh, we can do maybe uh, to keep that and to make it productive, we saw a, a couple of presentations which were pretty interesting. We saw uh, the youth from the Philippines. We saw uh, production and uh, professional stores in Indonesia. Uh, we heard the story from uh, from India. So, um, yeah, I'm. Uh, I would like to uh, ask Femi actually to um, to what do you think is necessary in in countries like. Philippines, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, but maybe also you have certain suggestions for uh, other countries, how to um, maintain the wild foods, to keep that tasty, those traditions, and, and also to bring it to the 21st century, because we cannot go back, but how are we going forward with wild foods? Uh, Femi, I, I'm very curious uh, to hear about that. Uh, are you there? Uh, Femi? I'm here, I'm here. Yes, great. Um, can Thank we show... Hi, Femi. Yes. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, maybe first uh, a reflection from you on, on what Diana said uh, in uh, Uganda. Um, how do you see that? I mean, uh, 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 Diana indicated, okay, quite a lot of... Uh, of uh, uh, wild foods are gone. H what do you suggest to keep those that are still there? Yes, uh, thank you very much. And it's good to hear Diana also give her reaction and uh, express that there are indeed some similarities and the challenge and the uh, unfortunate, um, uh, unfortunate thing that's happening right now that there's a, a loss of uh, some of these wild foods that our uh, colleagues have also expressed. We have, but uh, as diverse as the wild foods that are still available right now, the, the strategies and the voices and the experience are still uh, quite diverse. And we hope that we can um, continue to have a platform to support this uh, so that there's also some um, loop back uh, of um, support and resources that will also be provided for these initiatives. So we have prepared uh, a call Femi, to Can I ask you one question? Because you're the, the NTFP EP exchange program in Southeast Asia. Do you also, because you have such a rich knowledge what you're going to present as well. Do you also have an outreach to, to Africa or South America uh, to, to share those? those uh, maybe you can include it in your presentation, but I'm, I'm very curious to have this rich, uh, these rich ideas uh, also to, uh, to other continents, including Europe, of course. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's really, um, it would be great to actually extend and, and do a wider outreach to other continents, other regions. Um, and we have had uh, some um, uh, experiences on that uh, through programs like the GLA, the Green Livelihoods Alliance, which is a global initiative. And so um, with us participating in such global alliances, this is also the, the space where we're able to uh, have this cross-continental 
um, sharing. Although, uh, as you can see, our, our current network um, is on the ground mainly in, in South and Southeast Asia, but we certainly do not um, uh, say uh, no to opportunities um, where we could uh, have this wider sharing. But GLA would be a platform. There's also a couple of other global alliances that we're a part of that includes Latin America and, and Africa where some of these um, livelihood uh, initiatives uh, are able to be shared and us being able to, uh, us as an exchange program, that's also something that we, we have uh, basically rooted in our, in our strategy to, to be a facilitator and to also be a, a kind of a convener or conduit of um, uh, positive uh, sharing and um, sharing of experiences and knowledge. Okay, thank you, Femi. And so, uh, yeah, uh, maybe to, uh, we're now at the final part of this uh, session. I'm, I'm very curious how you think and what's your call to action basically to, to maintain th these rich and diverse and these, these nature-based solutions as it's called here uh, and, and the inclusion of uh, local communities, indigenous peoples. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see. Yes, um, maybe I can pull up the slide. Uh, we have prepared somehow a, a statement on this. So, so let me just um, go through them. So in the middle of the crisis and enormous threat around us, the climate change, biodiversity loss, the pandemic, food insecurity, deforestation, large monocrop plantations, mines, dams, and other infrastructure in the name of economic development and modernization, there are local manifestations of these threats and the subsequent impact to indigenous peoples and local communities everyday life and state of knowledge and, and indigenous systems and practices. The physical movement of people, broken social structures, including knowledge about forests and transfer of this knowledge within the family or community, Preferences have changed and practices are transforming due to various influences and factors. There is an overall decline as we heard in the knowledge regarding wild foods. The reasons can be traced to national policies that affect foods grown and their harvest, mainly due to import policies and subsidies, as well as an official oversight about the role of wild and traditional foods in rural diets. The expansion of monocultures and other changes in land use is a further reason. Mainstream agriculture has been delinked from, uh, has delinked food from nutrition and culture and identity. Likewise, mainstream biodiversity conservation has failed to adequately champion the indigenous food waste as a partner and as an additional um, substantive content in strategy. So next slide. But there are some silver linings. Knowledge while vulnerable are still available. Resources while declining can still be found. And there are thriving practices and the youth are potential torchbearers of such practice. If we work with them, encourage them and support them, they can champion and become leaders to keep traditions alive, thriving and resilient and keep their sovereignty over their heirloom food, for example. Next slide. Better forest and better lives. This was a quote that we heard from an elder in, uh, from India in one of our dialogues. If the forests are still there, they live and they will live better lives. But there is a broken part of that truth. The forests are declining rapidly. Tenure will bring back the integrity of the forests and ensure, um, and ensure the continuity of a better life for the tens of thousands of populations dependent on forest and forested landscapes. Women and youth, we must speak about them. We must let them speak and have their spaces for their voices to be heard, not hidden and invisible. Women as the frontliners and purveyors of knowledge about the food we eat and its sources and ways to prepare, gather and care for them, and the youth that this knowledge is passed on, and the values and traditions behind them are appreciated and live past their elders' lives and into theirs. Across the region, we need to establish and publicize the links between food, health, and biodiversity. And we also need to examine the correlations between wild foods and tenure, access, and consumptions. consumption. Partnerships in research and research that is participatory, indigenous-led, uh, indigenous-led would bring good value to this process. 
It is important to include all food waste prevalent in the region, including rotational farming, gathering, fishing, trapping, food gardens, and cultivation. Some of these traditional systems focus on non-mainstream crops, the forgotten foods. Their strengths and vibrancy should be known better in the local context and also the threats that they face. Let these be understood better and impacts by these threats be assessed and included in policy and program formulation on food, biodiversity, forestry and agriculture and climate. Next slide. Our work requires continuous updating with new foods and the knowledge and strat status around them documented and have the infrastructure and resources to support them like community resource centers, learning centers or field schools. Our work on restoration, not just of the wild foods itself, but also of the knowledge of the knowledge best way, the best way to know uh, the forest is to restore the knowledge about it and who best to lead the knowledge restoration but the people themselves who are closest to the source and the truth about forests. It is also the time to link our field work and observations to various other predominant issues on biodiversity, on climate change, on food systems, on land dialogues and tenure rights, on nature-based based solutions, on nature positive trade. It is important to include wild foods in the big discourses of today. And in the next few days, we still have the members assembly. And so we, we hope that it can be included there lest we miss to see the local realities running after the big picture. Finally, as a network, we call for, next slide, we call for like-minded actors to join us in speaking truth to local realities and actions which is already a position of strength and not have the need to validate indigenous knowledge by science, but use science to complement and elaborate on the trends that local people already observe every day and truths and local realities that they live by. I think there will be um, still quite uh, a long um, discussions to happen um, on nature-based solutions. And I think that in that, um, in that arena, uh, these local truths and local realities and actions can have the space to be to be heard. So thank you very much. Thank you, Femi Pinto, director of NTFPP. A very clear and uh, clear statement also to everybody here at the IUCN Congress um, to include the topic of wild foods uh, and, and the capacity that is needed for that uh, into our actions as a conservation uh, and sustainability community. Uh, thank you, that is, that is uh, great. I, I wanna look at the public. Is there maybe a final question to this, uh, uh, to this rich uh, audience of experts? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I see there a hand. Please uh, say your name and your organization. Oh, excuse me, you're, we don't hear you. Um, uh, sorry, Barbara. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Barbara Arizi. I am Brazilian and I am a teacher of the Free University Amsterdam of Anthropology. My experience fieldwork was in the Amazon with traditional community. Uh, with whom I learned a lot of hunter gathering techniques, also of processing food with the women. So I learned a lot from you as my friend from Ghana, I had the same, from Uganda, I had the same feeling of recognizing some fruits and some processing. My question to you all is, we in Brazil, we have extractive reserves, is a kind of special law protection where the communities have the right to collect the food, to process. There is a difficulty when you start selling uh, to a wider market, because one thing is to collect for your own consume, and another one is when you try to produce um, in a bigger scale. So how is this balance possible? That is the question. Thank you. Yes, Femi, could you answer this question uh, regarding the, the balance between own consumption and, and more production like we saw in Indonesia? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, the the situation is is um, different in in each of the countries. At least in our region, there are um, 
different policies that are already in place that do recognize um, that do recognize and allow for access and the continued use and practice of um, uh, hunting, gathering, harvesting, and uh, some opportunities for them to be able to market their um, products from their non-timber forest products, including foods. But uh, uh, admittedly, there are also um, some barriers, policy barriers that do exist, which also in, are in, included in our advocacies that um, if uh, uh, indigenous peoples do have the customary rights to access their, um, their uh, produce or their um, NTFPs in their customary areas, there should be also the opportunity and the uh, ability for them and the capacity for them to be able to uh, make use of them for their livelihood, including also transport and um, transport of these products and transforming them, value addition, doing some value addition for these products. So that uh, these are some of the barriers that still needs to be lifted and it has something to do, it crosses over to another dimension of uh, advocacies um, related to uh, the, the, the rights of um, these communities to be able to engage in the market, um, to have these collective enterprises be considered also as um, equal players in, in the market. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, there are, there are opportunities, but for the most part, there are barriers for them to be able to um, transform this, these uh, processing value addition activities into um, an economic uh, benefit for them, thank which you. is also their decision and their choice. Yeah. Thank you, Femi. So uh, indeed, you have the experience how uh, at least what the barriers are. In some cases, you were able to reduce them through policy influencing. Uh, that has answered the question uh, well. And in case uh, there needs to be more exchange, uh, your program has uh, very fit to that. I, I want to thank everybody and a fantastic huge chance to the whole Uh, presenters from the NTFPEP network. First of all, Sumin from India, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Femi, uh, Madhu, Bibong, and all the youth from the Philippines, Colleen, Crystal, Masia, John Vincent, and all the participants here uh, at the IUCN Congress. Uh, we have journeyed virtually to different countries. We saw a lot of different plants. Uh, we saw practices. Uh, yeah, I, I got hungry. And, uh, <laughs> but we also talked about the policies that are necessary. Uh, it's just, uh, it just shows that uh, we need to go for wild food. So let's join the NTFPEP in their call and their action for wild foods, biodiversity and community livelihoods in the future. Let's reduce those barriers. Let's give the access to the markets as well uh, for those communities. Thank you very much, uh, NTFPEP. Uh, I thank you for all the participants and I wish you a good day here at Marseille and uh, we'll be in touch uh, through the IUCN network. Uh, you can find this uh, production also on YouTube. And uh, please also register uh, through the uh, QR codes on the back of the chairs uh, if you want to stay in touch with ICN Netherlands or the NTFP network. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody.